Hello, and welcome to the first session in a new series we have here at Professor Carroll called Cultivating Beauty, Getting Started with Music Appreciation. Well, music appreciation sounds serious. I remember the first time I heard that term and wondered what it meant and uh, thought, am I doing this or not? Um, the, at the root of that word appreciation is a Latin root that really means putting a price or a value on something. And in the essence, every time we think about teaching anything to our children, we're putting a value on it. We know how we value both the moral and spiritual values we teach and all of the skills from handwriting and reading and, and mathematics and, and everything within our um, view of what we hope to pass down to our children and what we hope to use to bring their God-given gifts to life, their talents, their interests. So we're always working with passing on an appreciation for something, even cuisine, even learning to work with animals and learning about nature. It's all one great big, let's show and tell the value of what we have in our lives as adults and sharing it with our children. Now with music appreciation, we tend to think immediately of taking our kids to the orchestra, for example, which is a wonderful thing to do when you can do it, or something even more complicated sometimes. But today I'm talking about the younger ones. And whether your children are pre-K, three, four, five, two even, or in that first year of kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, they're looking at music very, very differently uh, at those ages, the, the little ones particularly. In some ways, they understand it better than we do. You've seen a baby hear any kind of musical sound or a sound of a doorbell or a clinging of something that's pretty or not pretty. And immediately, even at the tiniest age, they respond. And of course, while it's amazing when we can expose our children to the, the glories of our Western tradition, like opera and orchestras and oratorios and, and ballets and musical theater, the fact is they're going to be more interested in something at times as simple as a music box. After all, what is more magical than a music box? And you know, you can stop right there with your kids who are pre-K, K, up at any grade, really, even adults who've never thought about what happens inside of a music box. This one doesn't particularly uh, have that marvelous ability to open, but in part because it is wood, it has a beautiful sound, it resonates. There's all kinds of things that you can get in terms of exploring how a music box works. And that's both science, it's mechanics, it's a kinetic because you're moving something, it's oral, so it's sound. And I'll say another word about this music box perhaps in a moment. But again, we thinking in terms of all the big, wonderful things of music, and indeed for the little ones, those things can be overwhelming, almost to the point that they don't see or hear them. I mean, how many times do you talk to someone who'll say, oh, I took my my little ones, my grandchildren, my, my little kids to the Houston Symphony, but frequently we're sitting in the back row because those things are expensive, right? And it's very hard to get tickets and all of that business. And they were asleep within the first 15 minutes. Well, you know, sometimes the adults are asleep within the first 15 minutes too. They get relaxed, nice comfy seats, beautiful music. There it goes. So those things are harder to grasp. They're far away. They're big. They're grown-ups. And again, I'll say this many, many times, but we teach by something that they can touch and grasp and look at and explore and understand. Those are what we often need. So I want to say that in music, no matter what part of the world, and this would mean what we sometimes call world music, which is often a course one teaches, I've taught it before, where you look at the music in Asian cultures and Slavic cultures and African cultures around the world, there's actually a lot of commonality despite how different some of those traditions sound. And in Western music, but again, extending to world music, but let's just stick with our Western culture, we have really five basic elements of music. And that's where I like to start. And we know all of them, even if we don't know the names we give. The first one that maybe pops up, it's not a hierarchy. One is not maybe more important than the others, although we understand a couple of them earlier than some of the others when we're little. One would be melody. And let's face it, as soon as a child can start making that sound, and it depends on the age, but very young, often before they can walk, they're singing. Those kids are coming out with their melodies. Ah, 
whatever sound it is. If I have any rule at all that I would like to share, and rule is probably too strong of a word, but let me say plea. How about that? That's that's even stronger. I plea. I will plea with you at all times, if possible, when your little ones or your five-year-old or your seven-year-old or your 11-year-old, they tend to stop then, but is singing, no matter what it is, please, if it's at all appropriate, let it ring. I know you're probably driving and there's all this singing going on. It can get, well, I've had our granddaughter sing practically halfway across the country on trips. And yes, it can be a bit much, especially if you too are supposed to join in on every single wheel on the bus and itsy bitsy spider. But do you know how amazing it is that children in almost every case naturally want to sing? I mean, think about that. That is such a sophisticated gift that we have as human beings to sing. I mean, who else? I mean, animals make amazing noises and they communicate, but singing a song is an extraordinary thing. And here our little ones do it naturally. And until someone shuts them down and says to them, oh, you can't sing, you have a terrible voice, you can't carry a pitch, then it's usually over, especially at certain impressionable ages. I cannot tell you how many times I've had adults that I've met in almost every capacity say to me, oh, I love to sing, or I, lo I wanted to take music, or I wanted to sing in the choir. And then my second grade, fourth grade, sixth grade, Aunt Ellie, I don't know, somebody told me I couldn't sing. If you can speak, you can sing. That's a different subject, but just tuck that away. We'll come back to that in another series or in another session within this series of cultivating beauty through the incredible uh, phenomenon of music. All right, so let's go back. Melody I've mentioned. Rhythm, pulse, the first thing any of us really hears inside our mothers is pulse. And we probably hear a lot of other sounds too. We do, definitely. But that pulse, that heartbeat that is in us, the rhythm, and there's so many rhythms in not just our bodies, but rhythms of the world that we could, again, talk about forever. The rhythm of even the moon and the stars. I mean, that's a kind of cosmic or um, celestial rhythm that the poets and the sages of ancient times have talked about with great glory in their words. Um, there is rhythm. There is rhythm from the ticking of a clock. There is rhythm in the sound of a, of a, a anything snoring, you know, breathing. All of these things are pulse and they're important. So we've got melody and rhythm. Now, the next thing, which is very much determined by the culture, and in our Western culture, harmony tends to mean chords. We think of combinations of individual pitches that we put together in harmonies. We call them all kinds of names. And as you learn more about music, you call them triads. You can learn to call them by their identity within the scale. You learn to know what they do. You find out that some of them want to go, Let's do something with that. They want to do what's called resolve because we are conditioned by a do, re, mi scale or a Western set of scales. We call them major and minor. Doesn't even matter the names, but we were we are conditioned to go. And then we let it, you see, um, go to where it's supposed to go. And that is a conditioning. I mean, if we had grown up in the middle of a completely different culture, we would not perceive pitch that way, or certainly not combinations of pitch. And we wouldn't perceive their desire to move in certain directions. But most of us did grow up with this musical system. And whether we know the names or not, or can even identify it or not, we have an expectation that harmonies, combinations of pitches, chords, are going to do certain things. And when they don't, it's interesting. And sometimes composers won't let them do what they're supposed to do. And then they kind of knock us around in our ears and in our minds and hearts and give us something unexpected. And that's also interesting. Now, that's taking this idea of harmony or chord quite far. But for, for now, we've got melody, rhythm or pulse and harmony. Now, I want to tell you the other two, and then we'll look at a couple things with them. The other two have names we might not be used to hearing. The first one is texture. And texture, of course, we think of it everything from the texture of our, uh, our oatmeal or the texture of fabric or the texture of anything we touch. In music, it, it means the combination of melody lines. 
And that's, again, not a word most people would be familiar with using unless you're involved in studying music formally. But texture is important in Western music. As children, we tend to learn about the fact that if we sing, the wheels on the bus go round and round, sorry, I started that, I know. That's a single voice. If everybody in the class joins together, including several adults, we might have it the wheel way low and the wheels, the wheels. We'll have it at different octaves and maybe there's some kids singing it on different pitches. But the point is we're trying to sing one melody line. And that's also the basis of folk music. It's the basis of our Christian early church music. Uh, it's the basis of uh, the cantillation in Jewish tradition of singing the scriptures with a single melody line. It's really very old and very fresh and new and modern. What happens though within Western composed music and even improvised music of all kinds, folk and jazz and all kinds of things, is that we put other melodies into it. We make another melody line. We might be singing and we bring a flute line in that plays a different melody and it's pretty and it decorates our melody line. Um, we can bring it in as a decorative element. We can bring six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, we're starting to talk about an ensemble. Think of an orchestra. There are the, all kinds, I and mean, even within the strings, the violins and the violas and the cellos and the basses, they play different notes much of the time. And that gives us a thicker texture. And that's really the word, thick. Think of it like that, thick. Okay, we talk about a thick texture. Um, think about something that you might know, the Hallelujah Chorus, where you have all those singers singing their different exuberant lines and they all come together. But as children, we either, experience monophonic or single line, mono sound, one sound, phon, phoneme, phonic, monophonic. When we sing all of our little songs, the itsy bitsy spider, or when we sing happy birthday, whatever, or um, we learn to sing something very early. It's, and it's not so easy to do when you're little. By, by first grade, kids can pretty much do it. Maybe in kindergarten, it's kind of puzzling sometimes when you're younger. And that's called singing around. When we sing, row, row, row your boat, and someone else comes in right there with the next line and the next line. And if you have lots of groups, you pull them all together, you have a thick texture. And we call that mini soundedness or polyphonic, P O L Y P H O N I C. And that other word, in case you're writing something down, is monophonic, M O N O P H O N I C. Now, those names don't matter. Let's sing a melody. Let's put other melodies with it. And again, if you happen to be out somewhere where you're singing folk songs and somebody's got a fiddle and they do some fiddling in the background, you're singing a thicker texture. You're singing a polyphonic, two-voiced, uh, or you're performing or enjoying or dancing to polyphony. Again, your, your little ones don't need to know that word, but kids love vocabulary, I find, and they like to learn new words and especially multi-syllabic words and polyphonic is a pretty good one, right? At any rate, that's texture for what it's worth. Everything from what I just said, from Hallelujah Chorus to us singing a Frère Jaca and someone else Frère Jaca. I mean, it's fun to do. And you know, as adults, we stop doing that. It's really great when I, I do a lot of pre-concert lecturing and giving a lot of lectures on other venues. I'm often abroad, uh, particularly Europe, Eastern Europe and Russia with adult groups uh, where I get to teach really full time while we're traveling. But it's so fun to be in a position where you can get a group of adults who haven't done this kind of thing for years and they've kind of gotten set in their ways. And you say, let's sing around. And you will start with Roro or Your Boat or Frere Jacques. But there are other tunes that they know that work well as rounds. And people get just lit up. And even the ones that say, uh, they start doing it. And their ears are just aglow because we don't get to participate in the middle of that very often as grownups, unless we sing in a chorus, unless we play in a band or an orchestra, right? So again, now we have these, we have these other things. I think I'm, I'm just not my microphone now. Let me see if I can put that back. I did. I have to remember not to fling my hands around. Um, I hope that's good. So let's, let's go. We've got melody. We've mentioned rhythm, which I'm going to come back to. Harmony, the chords, the sounds simultaneous. Or if you think of a guitar st strumming underneath the melody or however you wish to think of chords or harmonies for the moment. Texture, that idea of sticking melody lines together and having this beautiful kind of connection at tapestry of of sounds and and melodies and lines and the last one is a word we really aren't used to using and that's timbre it's spelled t-i-m-b-r-e i was so far along before i always thought it was 
I didn't know what to say, actually. My, I didn't have a lot of exposure to French when I was younger. Spanish and Latin, yes, um, some other languages, but my French was slower in coming. And timbre, T-I-M-B-R-E. Timbre means, it sounds like it's going to be hard, it's the easiest thing in the world. It's the sound quality. It's created by the acoustics or the physics of sound. My voice sounds different than your voice because I have a different body, a different neck, a different head, a different voice box. Um, and not just that, everything, you know, if you bang on one piece of furniture, piano, but of course it's an instrument made to resonate. And then I can bang on this chair. It's something different. I just shook the camera, probably shouldn't have done that. But you know, uh, if I bang on my head, I get a different sound, right? And of course, who loves timbre the most? Our little tiny ones. We listen to these kids, these kids go around and, you know, they, when they're little, they drive us nuts, right? They bang on everything. They like to bang on their sisters, too. But And partly they just want to bang. But partly what they're doing is exploring the timbre of objects. Now, they're going to say that. And we get to be kindergarten, six, seven. We don't do it as automatically. We might do it surreptitiously. But when you set up an exercise where what we want to do is sound physical objects with a spoon or a uh, wooden stick or um, wood on wood or something, and we want to try to journal or record what we're hearing, what's higher, what's lower, what's deeper, what's richer. Um, little ones just want to bang, but the bigger ones can analyze. And it's not just physical objects, although I think it's great fun to go through and bang on every surface I can find in a room with a grown-up audience, because initially they think this woman's lost her mind. And then they start recognizing the fact that we hear what, is it is it fair to say thousands, if not more, physical sounds every day that we no longer stop to even notice the timbre or the sound quality or the sound wave quality, which makes if I if I come in with a box of um, groceries and I drop you know a can on the counter not too far hopefully and I then I put down a bag of chips and then I put down um, you know some bananas which also will make a sound and on and on and on we are just bombarded by different timbres but our ears are accustomed uh, little ones when they first hear a sound they take notice and then eventually they get used to it and they identify it but that's part of our musical ear that is part of the musical system. Ultimately, we enjoy teaching them not just the sounds of a can hitting the counter or a box uh, dropping on the floor, but the sound of a, of a flute and an oboe and a cello and a fiddle and a banjo. All of the instrumental sounds, and if we expand to world music, the sounds of the incredible uh, percussion instruments within the Indonesian orchestra, the gamelan. Um, I mean, really, percussion instruments are just astonishing, even within our Western tradition. But when you get into world music, the amount of sounds that exist out there that we many times have never heard. Talk about a rich sound palette or rich timbre. Now, composers care about that. They may write, and they usually do, in their head. Uh, it's sometimes composers want the stimulus of a keyboard, but often what they want is that sound, that pure ideas of sound in their head. And then they orchestrate or instrument, instrumentate. I don't think that's a verb. They do the instrumentation of that. They have a melody, they have the chords, they make a decision. Shall that be? And they probably know all along. I want this for flute, possibly in soprano, but then they may think about putting it in the cello instead for that melody and putting a, a, a lute or a guitar or a mandolin for the chords instead of the piano. Oh, that's how I want it published. And then, of course, if you look at great pieces of music, and I'll get into on another session what I mean by great, because that's a word we throw around, but pieces of music that have a long lifeline and that have been around and that continue to stay around and be heard and influence the new generations and people continue to fall in love with them. Um, and if you look at how those pieces once were transferred to us, you didn't push a button on your iPad or your iPod or your i whatever. You didn't go to YouTube. You either learned to play or sing it, or you went to somewhere where someone could. And people were so actively involved with music. Almost everybody sang or played something up until the electronic age with a gramophone, which isn't even electric yet. You know, and then you have, you know, the electricity coming and the early phonographs and and then you have radio and then you, you know, on and it goes. And now we have the digital world where, let's face it, everybody's walking around like this. Not maybe not you, certainly not me, but a whole lot of people. And music is now coming into this little this little speakers that, OK, they're they're not bad, but wow, they're far away from an orchestra. And OK, I'll start preaching now. 
to the degree, okay, to the degree, I understand the problems, to the degree that you can avoid digital sound with your kids, whether they're two, especially the three or four or five, five, six, seven, eight, 28, <laughs> to the degree, yourself, okay, to the degree you can avoid, especially with little ones, the digital sound and the instant gratification of pushing a button and getting virtually any music that's ever been written. Please do it. Younger kids are so much better served by hearing acoustical sound and hearing sound where you can see where it comes from than anything, you know, that comes over a digital wave. I'm not saying never watch a, a DVD of a ballet with a, with a whatever orchestra, London Philharmonic. And I'm not saying that at all because the beautiful DVDs that are available or streaming, if that's what you do, of major performance works, that is a terrific resource. I mean, wow. I saw almost nothing growing up, virtually nothing, unless it were on TV once a year, maybe, right? A mall and the night visitors came on once a year. There might be something back in those days. So the fact that we can actually introduce these great works to our children through the video medium deliberately with some understanding, I think it's fabulous. But of course, nothing beats real sound, especially for young ones who are exploring and analyzing. Now, what do I mean by real sound? No, you might not have the, the, uh, a string quartet living in your house. You might, but I'm talking about this. I love these bells. I love to buy bells. I have a complete weakness for bells. It's a good thing I don't indulge it all the time. These are pretty. I got these in Prague. I was in a toy store and I bought up every kind of bell they have. But, and you know, I could stop and we could think of 10 or 12 things we could do with bells. One bell, many bells. is actually always in bells, several pitches, many pitches. The acoustics, the science, if we stop to explain it, which we can do with our, we can do that with our third, fourth, fifth graders, of course, the older kids. But, I even have these actually are matching. You can talk about does it is it that? Oh, you say, well, I hear a little of that in there too. And, and we can we could actually put these on an oscilloscope. We could actually come across and find out what the sound wave, the fundamental pitch is, and what we call the overtones. And this kind of lab experimentation with acoustical science. I think acoustics is just one of the most interesting sciences. And I wish more kids had it as an option in their high school studies, middle school studies, you can do a lot with it. You might even look up acoustics uh, experiments to do with, with, with pre-K, with K. Um, but at any rate, going back to my idea about sound, and you, bells are amazing. I, I kind of got off from that, didn't I? All kinds of bells. I like this one. This is a matroshka. It's a, one of these wobbly ones. And the bells are in there. I, I'm, I've always wanted to cut it open. Just, but see, you can't do that, can you? That's part of what's cool about it. And and the way everything in there jingles and goes with it rods. Some of them have rods that ring with a metal bell. It's probably pretty loud uh, to you. I don't know how the sound's coming across. But there's a reason a one-year-old's fascinated. And there's a reason an eight-year-old can be fascinated as well. Regular bells, I, I'm not going to bring my whole collection. I guess my two favorite bells, I'll do this with you. And I hope the sound sounds okay. But this is like, uh, okay, well, this is actually a cowbell. Right? And of course, kids love to make noise with this. You can be outside when you do it. But then you can discuss the roughness of this metal. And if you do a little science work in advance, or just because this won't resonate the way something finely hewned and balanced and polished because it's kind of bent and bossy the cow didn't care, right? Whoa. Boy, does that ever carry, right? Or you can get to something like this. This was in our family. It's a school bell. It's so loud. I'm only going to let it be little, okay? And of course, when we hear this, we hear that continuation of sound as the sound waves continue to pulse out of the beautiful brass polished designed perfectly designed uh, form and of course from here we go to church bells the real ones the big ones and there you go to the difference between the western tradition where you have frequently melodies hopefully you've all heard a carillon and there again if you're not near a church with a beautiful set of bells that plays the hymns, you know, have you ever seen how that's done with these wonderful hard rods that come out that control the ropes? 
and you knockers and you, you, you beat on them with gloves that protect your hand or the Eastern Christian tradition where the bells are not pitched or tuned, but the rhythms of the bells communicate enormous amount of information about the, the services, the, the fact that the liturgy is beginning, the fact that it's a certain time. I mean, there's this whole thing you can go into with bells, little tiny bells. You can play with bells and get everything from visual I mean, they're beautiful or they're not like my cowbell. And you can also get into things like, um, as I say, the study of the way bells are used in Christianity. What about bells in other cultures? What about the palace uh, or court use of bells in, in, I'll go back to Indonesian courts or, or Asian courts and bells in the Old Testament and music in the Old Testament. Boy, it was noisy back there, really. I, it's just, you can go anywhere. I didn't even get into uh, symbols and, and, um, what am I trying to think of, you know, that you hit with your hand? Tambourines, yes, and on and on and on. But again, it starts with that fact that that sound, that timbre of that sound just wakes us up and we're so attracted to it. Now, um, I have now gone through the five basic elements that we have in Western music, and they are the elements we use whether we're analyzing a Verdi opera or whether we're analyzing a simple tune that our children sing, again, melody, harmony, rhythm, texture, and timbre. Now there are other elements in music, like text, words. If you're singing a song, you've got words. Not all music does, much music does. Um, and form. And form is something we're gonna take up in, in um, the, the discussion with the older kids. But form is based on repetition and contrast. And we all know form instinctively. You know, if we take a hymn, um, think of something like, and if you know Blessed Assurance, one of my favorites, and I won't go through all of it, but you know it in your mind, in your head, yeah. And then when we get to the second part or the refrain, right, where that's the same no matter what the words in the first part are, we go back, new words, first one verse 2, in the old hymns, verse 9, verses 11, they seem to have more time than we do these days. Um, but then you always go back to the refrain. Right? That's a two-part form. That's called a verse and refrain form. Um, in, a, in a little sense, in a pre-K sense, why is it? Okay, this is a bit extreme. Your six and seven, eight, your eight-year-olds are not going to do this. But you could, you could make the point. Think about Ring Around the Rosies. What is that form all about? That's one phrase. Same next phrase. Da 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 da. Middle. We all fall down. The third part. The third part of that form. You fall down. What could be more fun than that? When you're little, even when you're a little bit bigger. Um, and that's a form. And part of why kids want to do. I know my grandchildren. They're little. They just want to do ring around the rosies forever because first of all they like to fall down, but they want to fall down at a certain point in the form. They don't fall down in the beginning except when they're first learning. And then they anticipate falling down. Okay, you could start with that with your kids saying, you realize that's a form. It's, it's a four-phrased child song. But in the last phrase, we all fall down or London Bridge. Or, and we aren't as sophisticated with children's songs as our forefathers were. If you go back in a 19th century book of children's songs of English language or German language or, or any language, you'll find that there were many much more complex uh, songs for children than we seem to have today where they had all kinds of things that happened at a certain point in the song. And, and I find that fascinating. We would have to really, really learn them again. But everybody learned them, you know, in oral tradition. The kids taught them to the younger kids. And there was much more integration of moving and action and doing things at certain points in the song. That was part of the contrast with the rest of the song. Well, when you get into Beethoven and Bach and all of this, then we can talk more about this in future sessions. We're really talking about something that's the same, maybe repeated, and then things that are contrasting. So form has a lot to offer us as we have our kids learning to appreciate music. Now, I'm trying to think, there's so many things I didn't get much to the rhythm ideas that I wanted to get to. I always tend to go off things, and those of you who know me know I do that. But I want to say, well, I think I'll say, I have two things I wanted to say. Uh, and one of them I'll say for our next session, which is going to be live on Thursday the 22nd at the same time, but these will be archived and they'll be available on YouTube. But and, and I'll save that. I'll save that part. That'll be the mystery part that I'll start with next time. 
It has something to do with composers, okay? But with rhythm, because we haven't gotten back to that, except for me to say that learning to count to music, learning to clap, is something the little teeny ones can't do, but learning to clap and stomp and even move our body in specific ways. Look at the hokey pokey. I know, that's old. But do you realize when kids can do the hokey pokey or they do it in on roller skates or something like that, that's even cooler. They are doing something that's all about rhythm and motion together. They're dancing. They're doing a dance within a strict framework. And just learning to, if we have a march, right? Any march. Or we're marching to Georgia, whatever. Learning to do four. One, da, 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 one, two, three, four. Itsy bitsy spider, I don't care. Okay, that's a little fast. They're not going to be able to quite do that. But when you take something, let's play patty cake. Oh, I am seven. I am not doing that. Okay, fine. We'll do Sousa. Okay, fine. We'll do almost any song in the world. Um, Camp Tell races five miles long, do da, whatever. I don't care what you use. Having them be able to hit the down beat, which is important in Western music. One, two, three, four, one. Now we don't want to smack the down beat, but we want to know that we're going a cycle of because Western music is either based in what we call duple, two or four. One, two, one, two, one, two, whatever, or one, two, three, one, two, three, which we call a waltz. There are many other dances that have three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. There are so many things we're going to be able to do with being able to clap and count or stomp or bang or hit or do it in our only with our numbers or do it in our minds or do it with as we can learn as they get to be by second or third grade they like learning conducting patterns and you can see these online we might be able to talk about it some it doesn't work so well unless you're with someone but learning to go the down beat and up for two and then one two three i know that won't show up very well but when kids learn to do a conducting pattern to certain music in duple or triple or with four beats. They're really doing something very, very internal and strong with rhythm. And then they learn, and I'll close with this, how to do the really exciting, fun things sometimes with combining duple and triple or other patterns. Not everything's in two and three, but most things, but sometimes we play around with certain patterns like six which we know mathematically is three groups of two or two groups of three, and your kids are learning all that. In music, we call that compound rhythm. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Two groups of three. One, four. One, four. Or three groups of two. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. And, you know, getting kids just to do that, you say, or yourself. Practice it before you work with them, okay? One, two, and do big. Don't just go, uh, 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 uh. you'll do nothing. You have to yell it out. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two. You really got to do that. And you've got to make yourself do it physically. Stomp it. Knock on it. One, two, three, four, five, six. What well, do that instead if you want? There's some wonderful music, by the way, that involves knocking patterns onto the piano and forehand music. It's great fun. But when you go one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Do you see what I just did? I switch from one, two, three, four, five, six to making it three groups of two. One, two, three, four, five, six. Composers do that all the time and it's really fun. One, two, three, four, five, six. 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 You say, really? They do that? I'll close with this reminding you of this tune that many people know from West Side Story. One, two, three, four, five, six. 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 One, two, three. You see? So, whatever. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three. Okay. You say, well, let me tell you, once you can do that, start slow, cranking up the speeds. We can talk on the cello rondo in music. Once you do that, you're facile with rhythm. And there's many other interesting songs with interesting rhythms that kids enjoy. But you got to start with being able to go one, two, one, two. 
and one, two, three, one, two, three, and maybe going one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. All of these things that you're doing, however you're banging or ringing or singing, or just simply, as I said when I started, listening to something as beautiful and simple as the sounds of music boxes, or, and I'll save this for next time. What about this one? Whoops. Okay. Your nine-year-old might think this is silly, but your nine-year-old needs to figure out that it's possible on a slide whistle to play melodies and to be able to isolate the pitches and figure out what the intervals might be. Music is one of the great places to explore with all of our senses and all of our hearts. Interactive with every age. And here's a place where you really can seek and explore and have the globe nearby and look around the world. And you're doing it with very simple ingredients. Melody, harmony, rhythm, texture, timbre. We're going to build on those through this series of Cultivating Beauty. Thank you very much for being with us.